That's all I have. We're in Hebrews 12, and um, we're going to begin in verse 12, but let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much just for this morning and uh, bringing us here together, Lord, as your people. Lord, that the time we got to remember, the time we got to repent, and Lord, now we get to repeat uh, those early things, those first things, Lord. Lord, and now as we open your word and you desire to teach us through your word, I pray that we would be listening to what you have to say, Lord, that you would be honored and glorified in all that we do. In Jesus' name, amen. Hebrews chapter 12, beginning in verse 12. Therefore, strengthen the hands which hang down in the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated but rather be healed. Pursue peace with all people in holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many have become defiled. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. For you know that afterward, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. Now, what we've been speaking of, especially in this chapter, chapter 12, is running an endurance race. The Christian life is an endurance race. And in an endurance race, a lot of practical things need to be done. You cannot just wake up one day and say, I'm going to go run 50 miles. That's not how it works. There's conditioning. There's certain things you have to have, certain tools you have to have, certain things as we saw in verse 1, we need to take away the weight that burdens us. We need to get rid of the sin that ensnares us. Steps need to be taken before you just go run 50 miles. Maybe unless a bear's chasing you and you got all that adrenaline in, you might be able to do it. But the same goes for the Christian endurance race. There are things we need to do to help us run this race. Practical things that can be done so we do not fall short. And we're going to see that here in this section. And even though the, the author is going to continue to point us to Christ and say we need to look to Him, he's going to say we don't just look to Him. You, know, you need to look at the road when you're driving, but you still have to have your hands on the wheel a little bit. You need to make sure you're not veering off in the lanes. So look at verse 12 again. Therefore, strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated but rather be healed. So the author is continuing to encourage and exhort the church to continue walking in the faith or or as he's been saying, running the race. And he starts here by actually quoting directly from Isaiah. That that phrase in verse 12 strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees that's directly out of the book of isaiah which is something his listeners would have understood and remembered since they were jewish christians themselves and were familiar with the old testament especially the prophet isaiah and he starts by quoting and saying strengthen the hands which hang down now this is just a picture of a runner who's kind of given up his hands are just at his side and he's just The body language is all there that he's no longer in the race. He's not running with his full effort. His hands are hanging down of his side. And also it says strength in the the feeble knees. And it's just this picture of these knees buckling. All you want to do is sit down. They say one of the worst things you can do when you're running a race, or really in a lot of sports like that, is sit down because... It can really mess up your legs, especially when you're trying to go back out and continue to run. So these feeble knees are buckling, the hands are down at the side, the body language is all there that they've given up. I mean, this is what the author has been pushing against this whole book. They were wanting to give up their faith and go back to the old ways. And he's saying, look at you, you're, you're, you're the body, I can see the body language with you guys. You guys have given up. You're not even trying anymore. The exhortation is to strengthen the things that are weak. Again, it's very similar to the first verse of this chapter when he tells us to, there in verse 1, 
since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight in the sin which so easily ensnares us. These are things that are stopping them from running the race well that is set before them. Now verse 13 is actually similar as, as, as well to verse 12 and even verse 1. He tells them in verse 13 to make straight paths for their feet. What he's really saying here is you're on a race course and there's a bunch of potholes and you need to fix the potholes so you don't twist your ankle. So you don't injure yourself. Again, it's just going all the way back to that verse 1. The, the snares, the weight. He tells them, make straight paths for your feet. And there's a, a really good truth being spoken here. Even though the main point of these past few chapters and really the whole book has been to put your faith in Jesus, and that's going to continue to be the main point and main theme of this book. He's also reminding them not to shoot themselves in the foot with the things that they can prevent and do. He says, you're purposely going on a path that you're going to get injured on. Go on an easier path. Now, before we start scratching our heads and saying, well, wait a second, didn't Jesus say that the path is narrow? Few will find it and it's tough and it's treacherous. Didn't Jesus say that the easy path is actually the way that leads to death and many will find it? Well, yeah, you're right, he did. But this isn't what the author is speaking of. He's not disregarding what Jesus says or contradicting what Jesus says. He's actually pointing out that they themselves are putting stumbling blocks in their own way to their walk and their run and their race with Christ that they themselves can remove. See, when Jesus was talking about the narrow way and the wide path, he was talking about a path that only the Lord could lead them down. He was talking about salvation. He was talking about removing an obstacle that no one else could remove but himself, which was sin. Quite frankly, it's this tension that we also see in Philippians 2, verses 12 through 13, where Paul says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And if you, that's verse 12, and you stop at verse 12, well, there's the burden. You need to work out your own salvation. So good luck the rest of this week. Figure it out. But if you read verse 13, right after that it says, For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. So yeah, you could say, be burdened by doing your own salvation and figuring it out yourself. But Paul is really quick to say it's actually God who does the work. However, there are things in our life that we sometimes put as obstacles in front of ourselves that injure ourselves. Very many times. And that's what the author is speaking against here in Hebrews 12. He's telling them to strengthen the hands which hang down, the feeble knees, make straight paths so that what is lame may not be dislocated, but rather be healed. And really, there's many applications we can take with that. I would encourage you to seek the Lord and seek Lord what are the things that are dislocating my limbs as I run this race? How are my hands hanging down? Are my, are my knees buck? Where are my knees buckling? Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's a liberty you might have. Oh, you know, I, I think I can watch this movie, this TV show, listen to this music. You know, I have the liberty to drink. I have the liberty to do this and liberty to do that. Maybe it's a job. Maybe it's a hobby. Maybe it's just something that is causing you to stumble. And the author is saying, don't put these stumbling blocks in. Remove them. You need to remove them. You keep putting them there. God wants to remove them, but you keep putting them back. So make straight paths for your feet. Make it as easy as you can to walk with the Lord. And then in verse 14, he says, gives us some really practical ways we can do that. Pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. 
with the practical stuff on how we can remove this stuff, strengthen our hands, strengthen our feeble knees. He says, pursue peace with all. Now, this is a quote from Psalm 34, 14, where the psalmist says, depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. It's also very similar to what Paul says in Romans 12, 18, where he says, if it is possible, as much depart as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Now, I want to look at what Paul says in Romans and what the author here says in Hebrews. First thing, what's that first word in verse 14? It's pursue. It's an action. He doesn't say, hope you have peace with all people. Pray that you have peace with all people. He says, pursue peace with all. That's an action. That's something we have to do. We can't just wake up in the morning. You know, if, if you're married, you, you understand this concept a lot, probably. Better than most. If you and your wife get in a fight, you can't just sleep on it. <laughs> it never gets better. If by sleeping on it. What do you have to do? You have to pursue that peace in your house. You have to say, honey, I was wrong. I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have said that. You need to fix what was broken. It's something you actually have to go and do. It's not just gonna, you're not just gonna both wake up and forgive each other out of nowhere. It is something we have to do. Now, what I love, see, you can read that and be burdened and be like, well, now everyone has to be your best friend, right? Everyone has to like you. Well, I love what Paul says again in Romans 12, 18. If it is possible, as much depends on you, live peaceably with all men. See, Paul understood what it was like to have enemies. But Paul could say, they're not enemies because of anything I did to them. They're enemies because of who I represent. As much as depends on you, if it is possible, live peaceably with all men. There are going to be people that we just cannot be at peace with. But as believers, we are to make sure that it's not because of us. <laughs> that we're not the ones, you know, I, I don't want to meet with them. Nope, can't do it. They need to come talk to me. I'm not going to pursue peace. They need to pursue it. So guess what? If you're a believer here this morning, that command in verse 14 is for you to pursue peace. Not to wait. As much as depends on you. Live peaceably with all men. And so he says we need to pursue peace with all people. The action. The next thing he says is we also have to pursue. That, that verb pursue is, is also linked up with holiness. The second part of verse 14. We need to pursue holiness. Note what happens when we are not holy. He says, and without it, no one will be able to see the Lord. If we are not holy, if we are not set apart for the purpose of the Lord, we will not be able to see the Lord. We will not be able to have that relationship with the Lord. Now, just in this verse alone, the author covers every single relationship we could have here on this earth and out of this earth in heaven. It's a picture first of our earthly relationships, pursuing peace with all people. Peace is reconciliation, forgiveness, repentance, confession. And then secondly, holiness, pursuing holiness that's our relationship with our Heavenly Father. Not here on this earth, but up in heaven. It's a perfect picture of, ev of all of our relationships. Of, as some have said, our horizontal relationships and our vertical. We are to pursue peace. We are to pursue holiness. And what is, as, as Jason talked about this morning, what is the only way that we can be holy or another way of putting it, as he said, justified? It's through the sacrifice of his son, Jesus. 
If you're pursuing holiness, you will end up finding the Holy One, which is Jesus Christ. If you're pursuing peace, you will end up finding the only way to have perfect peace is from Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace. We are to pursue holiness. We are to pursue peace. That's the way that we can run this race with endurance. Now verse 15. Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many have become defiled. I want us to, to look at this as we've been reading this section. The author has been giving us things to do, action commands. And again, note the language there. We are to look carefully. We are to carefully examine. We aren't just to be like, oh yeah, you know, I, I think I've got it down pat. I think I'm doing a pretty good job pursuing peace. I think I'm doing an all right job pursuing holiness. I'm, you know, I'm better than this guy over here. I know that. But no, the author wants us to examine ourselves. You know, I, I love what Paul says about the Bible. One of my favorite pictures of what the Bible is. He says the Bible is a mirror. And what is the purpose of a mirror? It shows us our flaws. And for some of you, you're like, no, it shows me how good I look. <laughs> well, you only looked that good because you looked in a mirror and you saw where your flaws were and you fixed them. That's the purpose of a mirror. It's to show us what our flaws are so we can fix them. And Paul says there are, or there are, or that there are those who look at the Bible as they're looking in the mirror and they see how ugly they are and they just walk away and don't do anything about it. The best way that we can examine ourselves, I think, is reading the Word of God. And the Spirit will convict us like a mirror, man looking in the mirror and seeing his own reflection and seeing, oh, there's some issues there. The Holy Spirit will do the same thing. Or I love what David says in his psalm where he says, Lord, examine my heart. Or as the Lord says when he speaks to Jeremiah, the heart is deceitfully wicked above all else. Who can know it? And then he says, the Lord can. Ask the Lord, Lord, show me in my life where my hands are by my side, where my knees are weak. So he says, look carefully. Do these things carefully. Lest anyone fall short of the grace of God. This phrase, fall short of the grace of God, sounds very concerning. And, and it should be to anyone who hears it. Again, it's another picture of a runner who runs but does not finish. They've fallen short of the finish line. You know, typically when you run these marathons that they do... Um, you only get a medal. You only get a, a, a participation trophy for most um, if you complete it. If you don't complete it, you, know, you don't get to be a part of it. I know some of you are, have been part of, um, if you've served in the military, you've been part of different groups and gone through different classes. And when you get through one of these classes, you get maybe a patch or a medal or something. And how do you get that? Well, you have to complete it, right? The guys that only make it two weeks, they don't get to wear those things on their, those patches. And if they were to try, you know, <laughs> guys would have a field day with them, calling them out and stuff probably. Only those who have completed and did not fall short. It's, it sounds, it reminds me of a story in Acts chapter 26 where Paul is preaching the gospel to King Agrippa at the time and king agrippa was very well versed in the bible he knew the bible he studied the bible however as paul is pouring out his heart and sharing the gospel with him king agrippa says something that is really so heartbreaking to hear and many have said it as well he goes paul you have almost persuaded me to become a christian you have almost persuaded me he admitted I'm falling short of the grace of God. 
Falling short of the grace of God is, is simple. It's not receiving His grace. And how do we receive His grace? Well, it's not through works. As Paul says in Ephesians 2, it's by grace through faith. All right, that's what this whole chapter before has been about. In, the chap- in our chapter now, it's been about faith. How do, we receive, how do we make sure we don't fall short of the grace of God? Well, it's through faith. Not of works, lest anyone would, will boast. Many people will be face to face with the Lord and expect to receive that grace because of their own works. But the Lord will say, depart from me, I never knew you. And it will be because they never put their faith in him and his work. Now this next part of verse 15 seems a little bit out of place when he speaks on bitterness. Lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble and by this many have become defiled. Now is he just talking about bitterness like, you know, you just can't stand that person? It it can seem that way. Um, But what the actual context and the point being made here is that there will be those who do not follow the Lord and who will not put their faith in them. And so they, like bitterness, spreads through our body, it'll spread through their body in the church and spread to others around them if they fall short of the grace of God. And so again, he's warning them, look carefully. This is a warning text. And then in verse 16, as he continues, he gives us an example. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. For you know that afterward, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. See now, previously in all of chapter 11, the author used good examples for us to follow. Again, and even some examples that we might have been, I don't know if that's someone I want to be like. However, we see that the Lord counted them faithful. But now the author is giving us a bad example. See, Jacob we knew about, but what about his brother Esau? See, with Esau, he let the things of this world dictate his life. He did not care for the things of the Lord, but only for the things of this world. And that's why he speaks here that he was a profane person like Esau. He only sought the things of the flesh. And before that, he called the fornicator. Lest any fornicator, someone who's only seeking out, you know, sexual gratification, the things of the flesh. And if you know the story of Jacob and Esau, and Esau specifically, you note that he only cared about the things of the flesh. Right? It says here that when he gave up his birthright for one morsel of food, and that story in Genesis, when he comes in and he's so hungry and he's you know, kind of being dramatic, he's like, I'm so hungry, I'm going to die. May, give me some of your stew. And Jacob, being a cunning, decept, deceiving man like he is, he goes, well, I realize I've got the upper hand here, right? Supply and demand. You know, <laughs> I've got the supply, he's got the demand, and um, let me raise the price here of my stew. So he says, all right. Your birthright for some stew. And Esau goes, what good is my birthright if I'm dead? Have it. Jacob goes, you know, he's sitting there counting the birthright. Oh, great, good deal. Remember the birthright, since Esau was the older one, what he was essentially giving David was his inheritance. The full inheritance as the firstborn son. The birthright to all that their father Isaac had. And I mean, yeah, if he was dying, then yeah, what good is a birthright if I'm dead? (laughs) But from the context, he wasn't dying. He was just hungry. His outlook on life ended up getting him missing out on many blessings. And then he even saw that later on when Isaac wanted to bless Esau, because that was his favorite. So he tells Esau to go out and hunt some game and prepare him a stew and then he's going to bless him and then Rebecca, his wife, hears about it and Jacob's her favorite and, ja- and she says to Jacob, hey, I, got a great, I have a great idea. Why don't you dress up as Esau? Your father can't see very well so we'll just put some animal skins on you. Dress up like Esau and then he'll bless you and I'll make his favorite stew. And so he does that and when Esau comes back from the field and he realizes what happens... 
he starts begging his father, Isaac, please bless me, bless me. And Isaac says, my blessing's already gone out on Jacob. It's already gone. It says at the end of verse 17 here, that he wanted to inherit the blessing. He was rejected for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. When he realized that he could not get all that his dad had, that he had given up his birthright all for a bowl of stew, he sought it with empty repentance. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 7.10, For godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. If you were to go into most jails today, there would probably be a lot of people sorry for what they did. And maybe they might, might even just be sorry they got caught. I'm sorry that I didn't drive faster with the getaway car. But what the author's pointing, pointing out here is tears do not equal repentance. Esau's outward actions towards what he wanted didn't mean he was repenting of his life. Because you see after that, he, I mean, he was boiling hot with Jacob, right? Rebecca's like, uh, Jacob, you might want to leave. <laughs> you know, your brother Esau, he's, he's piping hot. And, you know, he's a man of the field and you're not. <laughs> he's going to snap you like a twig. You better run, boy. And we see that after that, Esau goes and he takes wives from the Canaanite women just to, just to get back at his parents and become a nuisance. And he was sad he didn't get the blessing, but he wasn't willing to repent. He had fallen short of the grace of God. He put his faith in his flesh, his faith in himself and what he could accomplish and that led to him falling short. And again, as, as we've been talking about, this, this Christian life is an endurance race. And if it's left up to you, you are going to be feeble need, hands on the side, falling short every single time. But if we put our faith in the Lord, we allow Him, as we pursue peace and holiness, we realize, as He said at the very first part of this chapter, therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight in the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. And here's where he's telling us to look. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. He, he starts it, he completes it. We are to look to him. The Christian life is a race that we have to endure, but there are still weak spots that we have that will injure us. And the author here is giving us these practical ways to get rid of those things. Yes, we look to Jesus and not ourselves and our circumstances, but if there's things that we have set in the way, we need to remove those obstacles. Lest we, like Esau, fall short of the grace of God. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much that First, Lord, you have saved us. You have made a way to make us holy, to give us peace. Lord, and I pray right now for anyone that doesn't know you. They've been running this race by themselves, and it's weighing them down. It's tripping them up. They're, they're bruised. They're broken. They're injured, Lord. And you desire to heal them and heal them completely. And so, Lord, I just pray right now that um, by your Holy Spirit, they would turn to you and not, not repent with tears, but repent with a heart that looks to you. They would receive that grace that they could never earn. And Lord, I pray for all of us as believers, Lord, as we continue to run this race, Lord, strengthen those places in our lives that are weak. Search us, know us, show if there's any wicked way in us, Lord. And if there is, I pray we would also repent, not with tears, but with a contrite heart and a humble spirit. Lord, fill us with your spirit. Strengthen us as we continue running with you this week. It's in Jesus' name we pray.